not really a big deal to me. But I assume if you are listening to my podcast and watching my videos that you like true crime. So what better present for a true crime addict than to talk about a famous uh, massacre that happened on Valentine's Day? This, so this is my Valentine's Day gift to you guys. We're going to talk about the St. Valentine's Day Massacre today. And this happened on Valentine's Day, February the 14th, 1929. And it happened on Chicago's north side. And um, any of you guys that are obsessed with mob history like I am, I've definitely heard of this. You already have an opinion, you already think you know who did it, and you're probably right, just like I am, but I thought it'd be nice to kind of go in-depth into the crime. Now, seven men associated with George Bugs Moran were um, killed on this day at the same time, and they were seven of the 64 mob-related murders that happened in 1929. The whole mob conflict started around 1924 with the mur- with the murder of a uh, mob, um, with a mob member, I guess you could just say, and it kind of spiraled from there. And in 1924, I think there were 16 mob-related murders, but in 1929 there were 64. And the attack happened in a garage that Bugs Moran used for bootlegging. Because, if you all remember, the 18th Amendment that was enacted in, um, like, 1920, 1918, something like that, um, made it illegal to have alcohol. So that's when these mobs really prospered, because they started making alcohol, they started opening up speakeasies. So that was their main source of revenue. Where today it may be, you know, cocaine that is, um, you know, kind of their bread and butter. Back then, it was alcohol. So, let's talk a bit about what the crime scene looked like. There were seven men lined up facing the wall, and they were just shot in line. And I think they, they determined that it was close to 70 pounds of ammunition were used to kill these men. That is overkill to the extreme. Um, And they found witnesses later that said that the perps were dressed as police officers. So, someone wanted people to believe that not only that they weren't connected to these murders, but that the police were connected. And I mean... Back in those days, there was a lot of corruption, so it probably wasn't a big leap for a lot of people to believe that the police were involved in these murders, but from what I've found, there's no connection between the police and these murders. Alright, so the victims were Peter Goosenberg, and he was a frontline enforcer for Moran. Frank Goosenberg who actually lived long enough to talk to the police and kind of tell them what happened. He eventually did die, but uh, he lived long enough to talk to the police. He was also an enforcer, and he was the brother of Peter Gusenberg. Albert Kachelik, um, who was Moran's second-in-command, so he's his right-hand man, you know, big, big man on campus. Um, Adam Heyer, who was the bookkeeper for the gang, he handled business affairs and money affairs, things like that. Um, Reinhardt Schwimmer, um, he was associated to the gang by gambling. He used to be, I think, an eye doctor, maybe? I'm not 100% sure. He was some type of doctor. Um, But he had kind of fallen from grace and become associated with Moran's gang because of gambling and betting on um, horse races, I believe. Albert Weinshank, um, he was a cleaning and dyeing specialist that Moran used a lot, but the, the thing about it is that Weinshank looked so much like Moran that a lot of people believe 
that he's what set the attack the attack in motion at that time. They believe that whoever came to kill those men saw Wineshank, thought it was Moran, and went ahead with the execution. And the funny thing is, Moran was running late, or he would have been there himself. Um, and the final victim was John May, and he was a mechanic that occasionally worked with Moran. So, uh, suspects. There's really, there's really one. Let's just be honest. There, there's one strong suspect. Uh, you know him, you love him, Scarface himself, Al Capone. Funny story, we have a cat named Scarface, and he's this big, fat cat that just thinks that, like, he owns the world, he lounges. Anyway, I digress. Um, so, and I'm just gonna, and I have this long list of reasons why he is a strong suspect. Number one being that Moran was his enemy. He hated Moran. Could not stand the man. Would do anything to harm Moran. Um, and he wanted to control uh, Chicago. You know, he wanted to control the liquor sales and um, be the main guy in Chicago. And Moran was in his way. He also had the manpower and the money and the connections to do the massacre. There's no question about that. Um, and Moran had really upset him because he hijacked some of his liquor shipments. Now, this happened in Detroit, and a major gang in Detroit at the time was called the Purple Gang. And uh, it was mainly made up of Jewish men that ran the bootlegging industry in Detroit. Now, Capone had connections with the Purple Gang, and they worked together. And it's believed that, um, I believe three of the, um, Purple Gang were around Chicago at the time of the murders. There are witnesses that originally said that they were, but then they, you know, completely recanted, which could totally be out of fear. Um... But Capone's like, no, I wasn't there. I was in Florida at the time at my home in Florida. Uh, so he wasn't ever charged. But one funny thing is Moran said only a man like um, Capone could kill people like that. And Capone in return or in reply to that quote is known to have said only, only man who kills like that is Moran. So, I think that Capone was a cheeky dude. He was like, I totally did this, but you can't prove it. I know you can't prove it. And Moran can just kind of shove it. Um, and like I said, there really aren't other suspects, in my opinion. Anybody that could be seen as a potential killer, I believe, has connections to Capone in some way. Um, everyone pretty much is convinced that Capone did it, but he was never tried. No one was ever tried for the crime, so there's no court case against them. There's no solid proof against any one person. But um, let's talk a little bit about the investigation that did happen. On February the 22nd of 1929, police found remnants of a 1927 Cadillac sedan, and they determined that the sedan had been used in the attack. They traced the VIN number of the sedan, and it came back to a cafe owner who was associated with Al Capone. They couldn't concretely tie it to him, but it is suspicious that um, it, it was in some way connected to Capone. Um, and they found, I believe he was a truck driver. He was a witness um, who the day of the attack sideswiped what he thought was a cop car and two uniformed men got out of the cop car or what he assumed was a cop car and he gave descriptions of the men and one of the descriptions fit the description of Fred Burke who was also known as Killer and from everything I can find Killer was a mercenary he would do anything for money he would work for anybody that would give him a paycheck so, 
Police suspected that John Scalese, Scalese, I'm probably saying it wrong, Albert Anselmi, Jack McGurn, and Frank Rio, who were all connected to Capone, committed the murders. But they charged Frank Scalese and Jack McGurn with the crime. Now, Capone killed Scalese and Selmy and another man in May of that year for plotting to kill him, supposedly. And, unfortunately, the, tr- the charges were eventually dropped against McGurn because there was lack of evidence. Uh, it's just kind of suspicious that pretty much the main suspects were uh, killed by the man they were supposedly working for. That just sets off red flags for me, but I mean, you know, whatever. Um, now, we talked about Fred Burt a second ago. Uh, he was eventually tracked down, and when they found him, a police officer, I think his name was um, Officer Skelly, uh, discovered that he was wanted in connection with the massacre. So he tried to um, arrest him, and Burke ended up killing him. But, uh, Burke had to flee, so they got a chance to search the place that he was living. And they found, um, Tommy guns, or Thompson submachine guns, that matched the ballistics at the crime scene. I think they found two of them. Um, and Burke was on the run for a while, but eventually he was caught. And they didn't have enough evidence to charge him with the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, but they did have enough evidence to charge him with Officer Skelly's murder. So they charged him with that, they put him in prison, and he died in prison in 1940. And, I mean, that's pretty much it. Um, In my opinion, Capone definitely is to blame. I believe that he hired men like Burt, Scalese, Anselmi, McGurn, and Rio uh, to kill the guys at the garage. And to tie up those loose ends, he started killing those people um and it seems like these guys weren't necessarily not all of them were connected to Capone um but it seems like they were the type of men that would definitely kill if you paid them alright guys that's it for today um as always drop me a line uh I'll put my links for all of my social media and all of my email addresses and all of my websites down in the description of the video on YouTube. Um, and, you know, happy, happy Valentine's Day. And if you don't have anyone on Valentine's Day and you feel lonely, you can always contact me. I, um, up until I got married, I didn't ever have a, uh, Valentine. So, um, I know what it feels like. So, I'm always here for you guys, whether it's Valentine's really a big deal to me. But, I assume, if you are listening to my podcast and watching my videos, that you like truth.